Welcome to Gateway Church. Whether you're joining us on site or online, we're so glad that you're here with us once again. We're gonna be jumping back into our Unforced Rhythms of Grace series, studying different spiritual disciplines. And today we'll be learning about the practice of Sabbath. Let's stand and let's worship uh, our good God through music. Uh, For those of you who are here on site, we just welcome you to uh, use your body to worship God by clapping your hands or lifting them up to him by humming along. And if you're watching this uh, at home in the comfort of your own home, why don't you join along by singing and using your voices. Oh, 
we believe that prayer is a really important part of our life here at Gateway Church. And throughout this entire series, we're inviting you to practice uh, different types of prayer. So today we are going to take just one moment to pray right where we are for other people's needs. And on the screen, you will see a slide with three different ideas of how or what you can pray about. And so just turning to the people who you're sitting with, or you can pray by yourself, I would love for you just to pick one of the following, um, just to pray for Caledonia in general, to pray for the upcoming American election that's happening next week. And third, you can pray to choose to pray for people just to come and know Jesus and to experience his grace and his love. So there will be a countdown timer on your screens. Let's just take one moment to lift up these uh, prayer requests. So Jesus, we just lift up all of these prayers. Thank you that you heard them, whether they were spoken aloud or not. Um, We just give them over to you. We trust you with them. And in faith, we believe that you will bring about an answer to those prayers. And we just um, thank you, Jesus, for how you are at work. Thank you for being a God who listens to us and who knows our every need or every hope. In Jesus' name, amen. And if at any time you need prayer and you're watching online, you can always contact one of our online hosts and just send a prayer message directly to them, and they'll be happy to pray for you. And as well, for those who are attending on site during um, our second musical worship set after the sermon, there'll be an opportunity for you to go to the preschool room and receive prayer from people who are there. Good morning, Gateway. My name is Jenny, and I just want to welcome you here this morning. We're so glad you're here with us today, and whether you're with us on site or online, we're looking forward to spending some time with you. It's hard to believe it's already November, and we've already been thinking and planning ahead for the next couple of months. Believe it or not, Advent is coming up, and this is a season of expectant waiting and preparation for the celebration of Jesus. Our desire is that this Christmas season would whisper the name of Jesus. To help you do that, we're preparing a special Christmas family package that will include an Advent Adventure Pack. Each package is full of great family activities to guide you through this Advent season. And because we miss seeing you, we thought we'd hold an Advent pickup party. Limited family packages are available, so please sign up for your package at the link below. Our Advent pickup party will be here at the church on November 23rd from 7 to 8 p.m. We're doing this drive through style so your family stays in the car and drives through the party. Hot chocolate, campfires, caroling, Christmas signs, candy canes, Christmas blessings, gifts, your family package, some of our leaders, and most of all, you. If you can't make the pickup night, packages will be available that week at the church for those who registered. If you are a young adult, we want to invite you to come on out on Monday nights at 7 and meet in the auditorium with us. Young Adults is a place to connect, build relationships with others in the same or similar stages of life, and be encouraged through teaching, conversation, prayer. And they like to have fun together. Monday nights are for you. We really hope to see you there. If you're being impacted by what God is doing here at Gateway and you would like to partner with us in making a difference around the world, the easiest way to do that is to head over to the website under the Give Back tab. You can set up a one-time gift, or regular ongoing giving, but either way, everything that we do as a church is made possible by your generosity and our partnership together, so thank you for your faithful giving. To stay connected with us during the week, we invite you to fill out a digital connecting card online and let us know how you're doing and how we can be praying for you during the week. You can also follow us on social media, and as always, we invite you to head over to our website during the week to answer any of your questions over at gw.church. Have a great week. 
Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Gateway Church's online service for Sunday, November the 1st. Just a little bit of a reminder that at the end of this message, we're going to have a time for communion, and I hope that you do have some bread and some juice for everybody who's with you there who knows the Lord Jesus as their Savior. Um, today, we continue a series of messages that we started a couple of weeks ago called The Unforced Rhythms of Grace. This is what we're calling the spiritual disciplines, things like silence and solitude, compassion, the study of scripture, celebration, slowing, prayer, fasting, unforced rhythms of grace. Now we saw a couple of weeks ago that when you make your life a song to the Lord, there are going to be natural rhythms that are very unique to you, which is wonderful, right? And my prayer is that you'll begin to see these spiritual disciplines as the cup that brings to your soul, your weary, thirsty soul, the life-giving water of God's grace. First week, we talked a bit about how Jesus made room in his life for silence and solitude. And then last week, we talked about the spiritual discipline of compassion, which is so important. And by the way, I just, I'm so thrilled to announce that there were 50 plus new sponsorships that were taken home for people to pray about, consider. Um, to sponsor a child with Compassion International. And as these gateways, as you folks get in touch with Compassion, either this past week or this next week, it will bring, we hope, our total of sponsored kids at Gateway to a little bit over 120 sponsorships. Friends, God is so good. And uh, what an amazing difference that, that you, Gateway, are making in the lives of children in the uh, rainforest area of Ecuador. So we're talking about silence and solitude, about compassion, and now today we're going to talk about the spiritual discipline of Sabbath, Sabbath. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn in our Bible reading today to Mark chapter 2, verses 23 to 28. And uh, and while you're just looking that up, I'm going to get you to think about something. What comes to mind when I say the word Sabbath? I mean, what does that word connote for you, the word Sabbath? Uh, Here's some random collections from from my bank account of my memory. I I remember when I was a kid, we used to go twice on Sundays to church, which I I appreciate that now looking back, but um, in the morning and the evening, I always kind of resented that we could never finish watching the wonderful world of Disney on Sunday nights. Always had to leave 15 minutes early to get to church on time. And it was especially tough when Mickey Mouse or Goofy was on. Another memory, I remember our family attended a Christian camp when I was a kid. And it was just filled with fun stuff for a kid to do. There was canoeing and swimming and golfing and uh, fishing and tennis. And I would run out the door in the morning and do all that stuff all day long and come home late at night. Except on Sunday. On Sunday, everything was shut down. All you could do was go to church and have a nap. Uh, You know, then uh, another memory, when I was about 10 years old, I... I went to church on Sunday evening, and my grandma was there, and she said, well, what were you doing this afternoon, Stephen? And uh, I didn't realize it was a trick question, so I said, I was fishing down by the river, Grandma, and I kid you not, she said, she pointed her finger, and she said, shame on you, Stephen. And I was like, why? And she informed me, you should not be fishing on a Sunday. And my parents didn't subscribe to that rule, so I didn't realize that was even a thing. When I was 15 years old, I attended a hunter safety course, and one of the guys taking the course with me, he asked the instructor, how come we can't hunt on Sundays? And another guy in the class pipes up and he says, it's because of those bleeping religious freaks. (laughs) Now, what do all these stories have in common? They all describe Sabbath as a day of nothing, right? Just sort of Uh, stuff you can't do or stuff you shouldn't do on a particular day. And it wouldn't surprise me, especially if you went to church growing up, if some of you have similar connotations about this topic. What is then the biblical concept of Sabbath? Is it just a day to do nothing? Is that what rest is in God's eyes? Or is there more to it than that? I will encourage you today to consider that question 
as we now read uh, how Jesus observed the Sabbath day. Mark 2, beginning in verse 23, it says, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, have you never read what David did and when he and his companions were hungry and in need in the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is the Lord, even of the Sabbath. I want to back up and I want to start with the first part of the first verse. He ended by saying that he is Lord of the Sabbath. And it starts here by saying one Sabbath Jesus was going through the grain fields. And something for us to note is that Jesus built into his weekly rhythm, Sabbath observance was on his schedule. We see this not just here, but also in other passages. I want to say that again because it's just so important for us to note this. Later on, Jesus is going to go on and he's going to disagree with some religious leaders about the purpose of the Sabbath and the the meaning of Sabbath. Because for them, it was just a day to do nothing. And for Jesus, it was really a day to do something important. But one thing that Jesus doesn't disagree with them about is the importance of the Sabbath. Concept. And so let's start by observing this simple fact. Built into Jesus' weekly rhythm was a core practice of setting aside a day to just slow down, to rest, and to do so by being intentional about what is most important. And his society called this the Sabbath. I want to take a few minutes now, and I want to bring us up to speed on what the Old Testament taught about the Sabbath, because it's an important part of the context of our story here today. To begin with, the Sabbath was part of the creation story. First chapter in Genesis tells us that God created the world for six days, and then it says he rested on the seventh day. So I want to just pull two facts out of this to note that first of all, the Sabbath was built into the fabric of not just the universe, but even human nature itself. Because let's face it, God didn't rest because he had to. He could have done it all in a moment. He rested after six days of work in order to show us how we should live. And so right after creating human beings in a certain rhythm, God rested to remind us that we have certain limitations, that we're not God. He rested to demonstrate that there's this beautiful rhythm for us where you work six days and then you Rest for one day. But what does that rest mean, right? The second thing I want to note is that the concept of of Sabbath predates the fall of humanity into sin. And so Sabbath isn't something that we need now because sin entered the world. The Bible says Sabbath was part of God's good plan for you right from the beginning of time. And so we see Sabbath observance is something that is hardwired into the creation of the human body and the human mind. And that's why it's mentioned right at the start of God's maintenance manual. You know how, guys, you know, you get a brand new lawnmower or a new chainsaw or you get a new power drill. What does it come with? It all comes with a manual. And you crack it open and the first page of the manual always goes over the safety stuff. You don't operate this thing in your bathing suit, or you don't tie the cord around your neck, or you don't let your infant run it in the bathtub. I don't know. Stuff you generally wouldn't know not to do, right? Back when I worked in my dad's welding shop, and whenever we got a brand new grinder, the first thing that the manual said in the first page, in bold black letters, was to never remove the guard around the grinding wheel, and the first thing we always did was just take it off because it was inconvenient. But my friends, there's always a price whenever you ignore the manual. And over the years, both my grandfather and my father almost lost one of their arms because of that decision to ignore the manual. One time I was grinding myself at the top of a big vat of paint, 
And the grinder got jammed and it was thrown into my leg, cutting my leg to the bone. And I still have this great big scar on my knee to remind me of the importance of reading and obeying the manual. Now the same thing comes true when it comes to God's manual for life, the Bible. Some Christians, as you know, routinely ignore God's loving instructions about Sabbath. And when they, do, uh, when they do that, here's the deal. They're not just breaking some arbitrary law that God made up to make your life more boring. They are going against the grain of the universe. They are fighting God's design for their own body and mind. And friends, if I can just say the, ob- the obvious, that is a fight that you just can't win. Many people, as you know, Christians even in our society work seven days a week. And I'm not looking at this from a judgmental angle. I'm looking at this from a what makes the most sense angle. Because these folks, you know, are chronically exhausted. They have spiritual problems, feeling distant from God always. They're, they have physical issues, chronic pain. They have emotional issues. They have anxiety and worry and anger. You've probably heard the joke, Where's Bob? Oh, he's in the hospital. He's getting his Sabbath taken up, you know? Friends, Bob is fighting a battle he just can't win because when you go against the grain, you always get splinters. God designed Bob to work six days a week and then rest for one. Unfortunately, Bob is learning the hard way that you can't really avoid the Sabbath. You can either honor the Sabbath one day, or sorry, one day at a time, one week at a time, or you can pay it all in one lump sum. It's usually in the hospital. So part of the background to the story of Jesus, and one of the reasons why Jesus honors the Sabbath principle is because Sabbath observance is part of the creation story. Here's something else the Bible reminds us about, that God's design for the Sabbath then was ruined by sin. And so when we get to Genesis chapter 3, it tells us the sad tale of Adam and Eve, and they uh, fall into rebellion, they disobey God, the wages of sin is death, and the curse is given that from evermore now we will be pulling from the soil, extracting our living with thorns and thistles by the sweat of our brow. Check this out, from Genesis 3 until well into the book of Exodus, the the term Sabbath, or the idea of Sabbath, is not even mentioned, not even once. And it's because God's rest is replaced with restlessness. People are constantly worried now about whether they're going to have enough, and so without God, they're Frenetic anxiety causes them to work all the time, and it also causes them to oppress other people so they'll work all the time. Predictably, this Sabbathless restlessness results in slavery, and it always does. At the start of the book of Exodus, the Egyptian pharaoh has enslaved the Hebrew people, and now they're working seven days a week to make bricks. Why are they making bricks? Because Pharaoh needs more storehouses to hold all of his grain. See, the economic system back then was a lot like ours today in the sense that it was shaped like one of Pharaoh's pyramids. You have millions of slaves and you have low-income farmers and workers at the bottom of the pyramid supporting the lavish lifestyles of just a few wealthy people at the top. And the Bible tells us about Pharaoh's insatiable demand for more and more production and talks about how it's literally killing the Hebrew slaves. The Bible says God hears the cries of his people and he delivers them out of slavery, takes them through the Red Sea and he takes them where? Into the Eremos, that's what we talked about two weeks ago, into the wilderness, into the quiet place as we talked about. And one of the first things he does in the quiet place is he gives them rest. He calls it, this is where we get this term for the first time in the Bible, the Sabbath. God says, just like me, for the first six days you'll work. And then he says on the seventh day, you'll rest. And the people sing 
The people danced with joy, as you can only imagine. And here's why. As preeminent Bible scholar Walter Brueggemann put it, the reason Miriam and the other women can sing and dance at the end of the Exodus narrative is the emergence of a new social reality in which the life of the Israelite economy is no longer determined and compelled by the insatiable production quotas of Egypt and its gods. See, it's not just one day off a week that makes them so happy. It's the freedom from an anxiety-inducing economic system. Sadly, in our world today, the economic system of Egypt is back in full force. The pyramidal economic system of Pharaoh is ruling and in some ways ruining human societies. They say there's nothing new under the sun. The economy today is dependent more and more on people constantly running. And if you're not working at home, you're working at work. And if you're not working at work, you're spending the money that you made at work. Both parents are working full time now. And I'm not against that, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But there's a cost to it. Part of it, the reason for this is because salaries in the last 30 years have not at all kept pace with the price of living, especially the price of houses. To deal with that crunch now, these kids have to do their homework seven days a week to gain the educational advantage that they need in order to succeed. And because good marks are no longer enough to get into the educational program that you're looking for, your kid now has to be an educational, sorry, extracurricular activity as well. This turns parents now into chauffeurs, and we're running around all the time to the next tennis or soccer or piano lesson or dance lesson. Those who then do well, graduate, and go into certain jobs are reluctant to relinquish their perch atop the pyramid that they fought so hard for. They use their advantage for political purposes so that they can keep their wealth, so that they can keep their influence. The outcome of this is that there are many, many people at the bottom of the pyramid, especially in the world, who they are left behind. They're stuck in jobs that can hardly pay the bills. If you look globally, the the inequality is tremendous. An economic system where the happiness of the few are secured, often at the expense of the many. Brueggemann puts it this way, it's a replica of the pyramid of ancient Egypt. Friends, what I'm trying to say is that the limitless pursuit of more and more is nothing new. And it creates a kind of modern slavery to anxiety and restlessness, mental uh, illness, anger and violence. In the book of Exodus, the first thing that God does for the newly freed people of Israel is he restores the Sabbath and he offers relief from that anxiety-filled economic system. Back then, God comes to people like you and me, people who have motors that are running at brick-making speed, and he offers them more than just a break. He offers them a completely new way to live. Here's how he does it. On top of Mount Sinai, God etches 10 commandments into two stone tablets. The first three commands have to do with loving God. They are worship no other gods, make, uh, don't worship idols, honor God's name. And then the last six commands have to do with loving others. Honor your mother, mother and father. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, and don't covet. Boiled down here, what God is asking his people is that they would love the Lord their God with all their heart and mind and soul and strength and love their neighbor as they also love themselves. But in the middle of the first three and the last six commands, there's a command that is a bridge between loving God and loving neighbor. The fourth command is to honor the Sabbath. I'm sure God's chosen people straight out of the Egyptian system were thinking to themselves, are you kidding? We love the Sabbath. I mean, you don't even have to include it in the 10. We'll just do it. And yet, as the people settled into the promised land, how quickly they forgot the Sabbath. And eventually they had even their own Pharaoh-like figure, a guy who brought back 
pyramid economics. A king named Solomon. Like Pharaoh, Solomon had this insatiable thirst for more and more, and it doesn't matter what it costs. And he set the people on a collision course with God's judgment by serving and worshiping the gods that controlled commerce, the false gods. At the end of his life, a very weary Solomon was quoted as saying, that I could find not a shred of satisfaction out of all of my grand endeavors. As time went along, the prophets warned the people of Israel, you're no longer loving God as instructed in the first three commands. You're no longer loving each other as instructed in the last six commands. And a big reason they said for this is because you're not obeying the fourth command that is meant to be a bridge between the two, is meant to be that which creates the space and the rest to make the other possible. The Sabbath was to be that day, to love God and to love others and to love yourself. And the people had given up on the Sabbath and had decided to throw in their lot with the gods of money and continuous accumulation. They had no time to love God, no time to love others, and no time to take care of themselves. Worry, anxiety, and restlessness, mental illness, and violence grew until, like a black hole, their entire society caved in upon itself. All along this slow burn, the prophets of Israel warned them about their failure to obey the Sabbath principle. For 490 years, the people ignored God's command to rest from their work one day a week. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the people were taken away into exile for exactly the same amount of time that they had ignored the Sabbath. For one-seventh of that 490 years, 70 years of exile. Now, after the seven years of exile, the people of Israel came back into the land of promise, and they rededicated themselves to observing the Sabbath day now. And that's where they were when Jesus came along. Very fixated now, legalistically fixated on keeping the Sabbath day holy. Every Friday night, Jewish people would stop their work. They wanted to love God, but here's the problem. They forgot that it was the bridge to also loving others. They forgot that the Sabbath was placed between the commands to love God and the command to love others. They forgot the Sabbath was first and foremost, not just the time to love God, but a time to love others. They thought the Sabbath was all about what you don't do, while Jesus knew that the Sabbath was all about what you do do. And by thinking this way, these religious leaders twisted Sabbath so that it became something that it never was meant to be. That's why Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Jesus spoke to people on the Sabbath. Jesus loved people on the Sabbath. And in our story today, he allowed his disciples to take care of themselves on the Sabbath. Because for Jesus, the Sabbath wasn't a day to do nothing. The Sabbath was a day to do the most important things. It was a day to love God. It was a day to love one another. It was a day to take care of yourself. In our Bible reading earlier, Jesus put it this way. The Sabbath, he says, was not, was made for man. Not man for the Sabbath. You've got it all mixed up. Check this out. He didn't dismiss the Sabbath at all. He said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. He didn't say, we don't have to worry about the Sabbath anymore. Just work as much as you want. He didn't say, go back to Pharaoh and do his way. He didn't say, that's the old law, you know. I came to institute a new covenant. That's not important anymore. Jesus said the Sabbath is still important, but you got to do it right. Sabbath was made for your benefit, not to ruin your life, not to bore you. Jesus is saying it's not a day to do nothing. It's a day to do the most important things. It's a day for you to break free from the constant clamoring of Pharaoh's system of more and more and more. It's a day for you to relax and take care of your body. It's a day for you to worship and enjoy the Lord, love him. It's a day for you to look around and care for others. And unfortunately, this is where Sabbath has gotten a bad rap. It's been cast in a pharisaical way, in a legalistic way, as a way as if you're just supposed to do nothing. And yet, friends, it's so, so much more. It's a day of resistance to the gods of economic activity. It's a day of disconnection from the economic pyramid of Pharaoh. It's a day to unplug from the constant anxiety of wondering, am I going to have enough? It's a day to trust that the Lord knows what he's doing when he said 
that he takes care of the sparrows, he'll take care of you. It's a day to remember that God can do more in six days than you can do in seven. I read John Mark Comer's book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. The last time a society tried to get rid of the seven-day work week was during the French Revolution. They wanted to ramp up productivity, and so they created a new thing. It's the 10-day work week. Oh, yay. It was an absolute disaster. The economy crashed. The suicide rate went through the roof, and productivity went down. See, study after study has proven that after you work a certain number of hours every week, your productivity plummets. Do you want to know what the number of hours is? 50. Interestingly, that's a, six, uh, that's a six day work week. It looks to me like maybe, maybe God knew what he was talking about all along. One study proved that there was zero difference in productivity between workers who logged 70 hours a week and those who worked 55. Friends, the word for Sabbath literally means to stop. And so why don't you just stop? Stop working for a day. Stop stop accumulating more stuff, even if it's just for a day. Stop wanting more things for a day. Stop worrying for a day. Maybe time to stop going on Facebook and looking at other people's lives for a day and start to live your own life. Maybe take a week to stop getting back to your texts and your emails. Put the phone down in love on your family. I don't say it in a legalistic way. I say it in a loving way. Students, maybe take a day to stop and trust that you can get your homework done in six days. And for the sake of your mental and spiritual health students, stop studying for that test and go for a drive instead. Go on a walk. Go visit a relative. Drop in on a friend. Love God. Love others. And take care of yourself. Dads, maybe just once a week, stop working, trying to make everything just perfect for your family. and Maybe just enjoy them for once. Take a deep breath one day this week and just stop. Look out the window and enjoy the changing of the season. My friends, I'm not suggesting you go back to the old days of legalistically doing this. If you can't observe Sabbath on a Sunday because you got a shift at work or you're a farmer and the beans have got to come off before the rain comes, maybe take you know, your day off when it rains. Or take next Saturday off, and you can say you're doing it just like they did in the Bible. In the book of Romans chapter 14, the Apostle Paul notes that there used to be a lot of day, a debate in the early church about which day to observe the Sabbath. Some Christians back then said, we need to do it Saturday, because that's the way that God did it, and that was the right day. And then some Christians said, no, Jesus rose on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, so that should be our new Sabbath now that we have a new covenant. And the Apostle Paul cut through all the stuff, and he said, look at it, doesn't matter which day you observe. This day or that day, he says, it's the principle that matters. We're in a new covenant in Christ. It's still important. And so these days, I happen to take Fridays and Saturdays off. One of those days, I try to work around the house. I try to get stuff done, because that's not really a Sabbath day, but it still needs to be done. I got to do budgets. I got to work. And the other day, I try to relax. I try to focus on God. I like to try to Focus on, take care of some of the people in my life. I try to take care of myself. But it's not a legalistic thing. And if I have a wedding to do on a Saturday, I do my best to try to take a different day of the week. It's the principle of the thing that matters. It's unplugging once a week from the pyramid and plugging into what matters most. Remember, friends, you weren't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for you. He loves you and he wants what's best for you. As I said the last time I, I preached about this kind of thing, you've got to find your own rhythm in this stuff. I mean, every other spiritual discipline is like this, too. You don't just look around and try to copycat somebody next to you. Play your own music, as I said. Don't be a cover band for Jesus. Pray, and I believe the Lord will lead you to take at least a day a week to resist the anxiety-inducing ways of Pharaoh and enter into God's amazing rest, a day to love God a day to love others, a day to love yourself. I mentioned that the Hebrew word Sabbath means to stop. But like many English words, there are sometimes other meanings. Hebrew words sometimes as well. Another meaning of the Hebrew word of Sabbath is to delight. And so think of Sabbath as this, to stop and delight. That's what God was doing. 
After six days of creation, he stopped and he took delight in his work. Remember, the Sabbath was made for you. And so, if you're new to this Sabbath thing, and you'd like to get some training wheels on this spiritual discipline and principle this coming week, here's a good question for you to ask. It's up on the screen. What could I do for 24 hours that would fill my soul with a deep, throbbing joy? that would make me spontaneously combust with wonder, awe, gratitude, and praise. Let's put that question to the Lord as we now prepare our hearts for communion. Friends, wherever you are today, I want you to take a moment of silence, to just enter into a place of silence and solitude as you look at this picture that was painted by, well, my favorite artist, Tom Thompson. I want you to just slow down. Just take a few breaths. Just look at the picture. Friends, I love the outdoors. And I like to imagine that this is a place, a special place in the Aramos, in the wilderness, where I could go to be alone with the Lord. As you look now at this picture, imagine that you are in that quiet place with him. Let's bring that question up again and see as we listen if the Lord will bring something to mind. So we ask this question. Lord, what could I do for 24 hours this week that would fill my soul with a deep, throbbing joy? that would make me spontaneously combust with wonder, awe, gratitude, and praise. It's my prayer that as you look upon that picture that you can see yourself and the Lord together in that. Maybe you can see yourself sitting on that rock or walking along the moss-covered path or gazing out upon the lake. And it may be that the Lord began to show you and began to reveal to you how you could set aside that time, that Sabbath time. I'm going to invite you to please direct your attention now to the bread and to the cup. If you would take of the bread now, and if you would take of the cup, we turn our attention now to the death of Jesus on the cross, to the love that atoned and that paid for our sin. Let's also listen as we look at the elements, as we think of the elements and all that they mean. Let us ask the Lord, is there any sin I need to confess? Any lie I need to renounce? Is there any relationship that needs to be reconciled? Let's pray and listen to the Lord. I will invite you now to eat and to drink together, remembering all that Jesus has done for us. Let's eat and drink together.
let's stand once again and lift our hands uh, to Jesus as we worship him through music.
Well, friends, as you, as you honor the Sabbath principle in your life this week, may you experience the joy of the exodus that God through Christ has set you free. Amen.